Imagine a young Mark Zuckerberg, fresh, fresh faced and full of ambition, sitting in a Palo Alto apartment with a group of friends. It's 2004, and Facebook is just beginning to gain tra tra traction. But here's the twist Zuckerberg wasn't content with just building a social network, he wanted to push the boundaries of what was possible with technology. In a stroke of daring creativity, he decided to create a virtual butler named Jarvis. No, this wasn't fiction. It was Zuckerberg's personal AI assistant, inspired by Tony Stark's Jarvis from the Iron Man movies. Equipped with artificial intelligence, voice recognition, and the ability to control household appliances, Jarvis was designed to help Zuckerberg with tasks around the house. But Zuckerberg being Zuckerberg, he didn't stop at just programming a virtual assistant. He chronicled the entire process of building Jarvis complete with challenges, successes, and even humorous mishaps in a series of Facebook posts. From coding late into the night to teaching Jarvis to recognize his voice commands, Zuckerberg's journey with his AI creation unfolded in real time for the world to see. The story takes an unexpected turn when Zuckerberg invited actor Morgan Freeman to voice Jarvis, adding a touch of Hollywood magic to his everyday life. Freeman's unmistakable voice would greet Zuckerberg, provide weather updates, control lights, and even entertain guests, all at the command of Zuckerberg's voice. The result? A glimpse into the future of AI integration into daily life, a personal project that showcased Zuckerberg's passion for technology, and a touch of whimsy as the CEO of Facebook welcomed Jarvis as a member of his household. So as we embark on this podcast journey, we delve into the lesser-known tales of Mark Zuckerberg from those kind of ambitious AI experiments to the innovative projects that showcase this great mind of a tech visionary as today we are in the midst of an AI wave and a lot of what he had created there 20 some years ago are things that are becoming more commercialized and realized now within this AI wave. So Definitely a tech visionary. That story, an excerpt, offers a peek into his lesser known, more whimsical side, highlighting curiosity, creativity, and hands-on approach to technology that he exhibits today. Really sets the stage for today's episode on Mark Zuckerberg, episode 29. And with that, welcome back to Leaders, a podcast dedicated to exploring the best leaders this world has ever seen. Episode 11, we covered Facebook's COO, Sheryl Sandberg, and given all the recent developments within AI, as well as the Facebook meta company, it seemed relevant that we needed to also study and research the leadership style and methods of Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and current CEO of Facebook. And so those innovative, quirky projects that have shaped uh, Zuckerberg's career really highlights throughout its evolution how Facebook has evolved as a company as well. And so in 2004 is when he's really launching it at Harvard so we'll just take you through quickly some of the key uh, events and things that have, hap have happened through his career that have shaped uh, part of his leadership style. And so while he's starting at, studying at Harvard, he launched the Facebook uh, as a sp social networking site for, their, for the students there. It really marked the birth of what would become later Facebook, the largest social media platform in the world. He expanded that beyond Harvard, so... He went to other universities, eventually opened it to high school students. That really fueled rapid growth and engagement, attracting millions of users within a short amount of time. He then surfaced it open source to the public in 2006, allowing anyone with a valid email to join. That move really accelerated their user base growth and paved the way for its global dominance. Another key point was when they acquired Instagram. So in 2012, he made the bold move by acquiring that photo sharing app, Instagram, for a billion dollars, which has been a great sort of acquisition within how that has grown and integrated into the Facebook company. 
he also introduced the newsfeed in 2006. That's that was a central hub for users to see updates from their friends and pages they follow. Despite initial backlash from the users, that newsfeed has really become the cornerstone of the Facebook experience, increasing engagement, time spent on the platform. Throughout time too, he's fended off competition, so he's made some strategic decisions, notably when he turned down offers to sell Facebook, including a reported billion dollar offer from Yahoo in 2006. Instead, he focused on growing the company independently. They launched Facebook ads, so playing a pivotal role in their ad platform, that's become obviously a big, major revenue stream for the company and revolutionized digital marketing and contributed significantly to their financial success. He then, in 2021, the last kind of event that we'll cover off before getting into more of uh, Mark and his leadership style is the rebrand to Meta platform. So he announced uh, a, a new focus on the metaverse, virtual reality, augmented reality technologies that made that shift from Facebook to Meta platforms. It pos- aimed to position the company for the future of interconnected digital experiences. So all these kind of defining moments, business decisions really highlighted his vision risk-taking appetite and ability to adapt to changing technological landscapes. They not only shaped Facebook's tremendous growth throughout this time into a global powerhouse, but also positioned the company at the forefront of innovation in the tech industry. So with that, let's go into now Mark as a leader. And so his leadership style to start off, and then we'll dive into some more Examples that we've uh, pulled from some sources, quotes, interviews, leadership style characterized by a combination of different approaches. He's really known to utilize uh, three different styles of leadership, autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire. Zuckerberg really describes as a transformational leader who encourages innovation, growth, and constant improvement valuing collaboration, creativity, risk-taking among his employees, embodying characteristics of uh, transformational, laissez-faire, servant, and visionary leadership styles. You know, despite being transformational in his approach, he also incorporates elements of autocratic leadership, too, when he's ensuring that tasks are completed efficiently. The leadership qualities also include being passionate, communicative, problem solving, empowering employees throughout his career, uh, ability to also break traditional hierarchical structures, foster open communication, encourage innovation, and prioritize employee well-being. Um, so so some common kind of qualities there within leadership styles generally to start things off. Uh, one of the interesting things that I think uh, he has in contrast with some of the leaders is more recently he gave an interview with Morning Brew. And on that podcast, he mentioned that one of his most controversial leadership or management things is that he actually doesn't believe in delegating that much. So uh, often common practice or common best practice rather is as a in a position of leadership you want to be able to enable uh, and really delegate down tasks that are um, more mundane or, or kind of repetitive or in the details so to speak and leaders are supposed to kind of be more top level uh, higher thinking looking more long term he mentions that he kind of thinks like the way a founder should work is you should basically make as many decisions and get involved in as many things as you can. So he doesn't believe in that kind of like delegation effort. He thinks he needs to sort of be in the details of everything and no task is really um, beneath him. And I think that also parallels with when we spoke about Jensen Wang in episode 20 uh, a recent interview with him too says that basically any any task, big or small, is really never un- underneath beneath him. Uh, he's willing to do the work. He's he wants to be in the details to understand what is going on and make those kind of key decisions along the way. So, an interesting contrast. Um, 
one that he is super involved with things. He learns through mistakes. He's really trying to hire for raw intelligence and alignment with what they're trying to do. Someone who believes in their ultimate mission, uh, which we will go into a little bit more as, as far as how that has evolved with Facebook. Uh, another few things here is that he says, find that thing that you are super passionate about. A lot of founding principles of Facebook are that if people have access to more information and are more connected, it will make the world better. People will have more understanding, more empathy. That's the guiding principle for me. On hard days, I really just step back, and that's the thing that keeps me going. So that was his uh, advice to young entrepreneurs um, and how to apply that into starting a company. He's definitely uh, what he describes as not arrogant but profoundly certain. So he has high conviction for the ideas and vision that he has for Facebook as that evolves. The success of experiments uh, show that he has a knack for creating simple and addictive software. Also has passion to connect people to create an open world. It didn't matter in what format or for what purpose. Mark Zuckerberg had a strong desire to help people connect and through that to enrich their lives. He wanted to build a social utility. And he also wants to build something that he believes in. Aligning his business interests with his personal philosophy. And so Facebook's mission, founded in 2004, is to make the world more open and connected. People use Facebook to stay connected with friends and family. To discover what's going on in the world and to share and express what matters to them. Whenever anyone asks him about his priorities, he always cites growth and constant improvement in user experience. So he's definitely focused on that. Uh, an early letter that delves more into this sort of mission and clearly shows his passion, uh, the company's purpose for existence, his long-term vision, and then uh, illustrates five company original values. And so we will walk through some of that along with the culture of Facebook next. And so those five values he originally formulated were one, focus on impact, two, be fast, three, be bold, four, be open, and five, build social value. So this uh, unique culture that he has formed actually has a name that he has placed on it, and I think it is also the address of where Facebook headquarters is. And so he's cultivated a unique culture and management approach that we call the hacker way. The word hacker has an unfairly negative connotation from being portrayed in the media as people who break into computers. In reality, hacking just means building something quickly or testing the boundaries of what can be done. Like most things, it can be used for good or bad, but the vast majority of hackers I've met tend to be idealistic people. The hacker way is an approach to building that involves continuous improvement and iteration. Hackers believe that something can always be better and that nothing is ever complete. They just have to go fix it, often in the face of people who say it's impossible or are content with stat the status quo. Hackers try to build the best services over the long term by quickly releasing and learning from smaller iterations rather than trying to get everything right all at once. To support this, they have built a testing framework that at any given time can uh, sort of run through these things. So... Within Facebook, too, they also have the words done is better than perfect painted on their walls to remind ourselves to always keep shipping. Hacking is also an entirely, inherently hands-on and active discipline. So definitely hands-on, as, as we see, uh, doesn't mind kind of not micromanaging, but being in the details. He's definitely more a hands-on leader than a hands-off leader. Instead of debating for days whether a new idea is possible or what the best way to build something is, hackers would rather just prototype something and see what works. There's a hacker mantra that you'll hear a lot around Facebook offices, code wins arguments. Hacker culture is also extremely open and meritocratic. Hackers believe that the best idea and implementation should always win not the person who is best at lobbying for an idea or the person who manages the most people. To encourage this approach, every few months we have a hackathon where everyone builds prototypes for new ideas they have. 
At the end, the whole team gets together and looks at everything that has been built. Many of our most successful products came out of hackathons, including timeline, chat, video, our mobile development framework, and some of our most important infrastructure like the hip hop compiler. So a lot of these uh, relate obviously to engineering, uh, but they've also distilled a lot of those principles down into the five uh, core values of how they run Facebook. And so those are mentioned earlier, um, but also include, and we want to go into more detail as far as what each of these means. And so one is a focus on impact. So if we want to have the biggest impact, the best way to do this is to make sure we always focus on solving the most important problems. It sounds simple, but we think most companies do this poorly and waste a lot of time. We expect everyone at Facebook to be good at finding the biggest problems to work on. Two, move fast. Moving fast enables us to build more things and learn faster. However, as most companies grow, they slow down too much because they're more afraid of making mistakes than they are of losing opportunities by moving too slowly. We have a saying, move fast and break things. The idea is that you never break anything. You're probably not moving is that if you never break anything, you're probably not moving fast enough. Be bold. So building great things means taking risks. This can be scary and prevents most companies from doing the bold things they should. However, in a world that's changing so quickly, you're guaranteed to fail if you don't take any risks. We have another saying, the riskiest thing is to take no risks. We encourage everyone to make bold decisions, even if that means being wrong some of the time. Number four, be open. We believe that a, few, a more open world is a better world because people with more information can make better decisions and have a greater impact. That goes for running our company as well. We work hard to make sure everyone at Facebook has access to as much information as possible about every part of the camp company so that they can make the best decisions and have the greatest impact. And finally, number five is build social value. Once again, Facebook exists to make the world more open and connected and not just to build a company. We expect everyone at Facebook to focus every day on how to build real value for the world in everything they do. Thanks for taking the time to read this letter. We believe that the we have an opportunity to have an important impact on the world and build a lasting company in the process. So that was its final mark there of, um, I look forward to building something great together. Um, the final words there of that letter outlining those five values uh, of which have changed more recently and so um, just a little bit more on the hacker way before we uh, dive into he's actually in that same morning brew interview he he has mentioned um, pivoting off of those five original values into ones that he's updated uh, more recently uh, I think that was also mentioned in uh, the Tim Ferriss interview that he gave that we will reference as well um, to Facebook's founder, hacker culture is a group's ability to build something better than one individual could. There's an intense focus on openness, sharing information as both an ideal and a practical strategy to get, get things done. He gives those engineers full freedom. Everyone can contribute. Every suggestion counts. His word is final, though. He ensures that everything the company does is in line with his vision. And so the pivot off of those five original values that we just went through and into new ones that he's uh, exchanged within the last, uh, I'd say, year or two is the idea of moving fast, he says, is one of the newer principles. Live in the future, distributed workforce, build awesome things. And another uh, concept more so in the workforce and it's called kind of meta mates. So embracing the digital experience and, and distributed workforce within that. 
and more so within that workforce and teams and building. He he also has some thoughts on that as well. So I wanted to share a few quotes with how Mark thinks about that. So he's always focused on a couple things. One is having a clear direction for the company and what we build. And the other is just trying to build the best team possible toward that. I think as a company, if you can get those two things right, having a clear direction on what you are trying to do and bringing in great people who can execute on the stuff, then you can do pretty well. One thing he says that gets blown out of proportion is the emphasis on the individual. The success of Facebook is really all about the team that we've built. In any company, that's going to be true. One of the things that we focused on is keeping the company as small as possible. How do you do that? You make sure that every person you add to your company is really great. More on another topic here of transparency and assurance. So Mark also aspires to full transparency in his leadership style. Every Friday afternoon, he holds open forums with employees and allows for candid Q&A. Not only that, Zuck asks others to share their own stories, ideas, impressions. He also keeps his word. Integrity is very important to him. One of the Facebook veterans concurs. Mark has never missed a commitment that he's made about resources he would give us. Uh, by the accounts of many of his friends and co-workers, under Zuck's hoodie, his famous kind of uh, CEO uniform, if you will, uh, which is an, uh, an interesting topic that uh, Jensen Wang, he has kind of a leather jacket as his, his uh, sort of uniform. Steve Jobs, who we've studied to episode two, had the kind of signature black turtleneck. For Zuckerberg, it is either the, the hoodie or and or like the, the kind of t-shirt um, sort of Silicon Valley um, tech entrepreneur sort of look to him. And so uh, under that hoodie, he's a very assured leader, though. He's really sharp, determined, hard worker. He's a sponge for learning. He asks more questions. Then he makes statements and continually inquires as to the why. He also has a clear sense of what he is good at, product design and strategy, and where he is lacking, sort of the day-to-day -day management and operations. To compensate for that, he hired sharp people, like Sheryl Sandberg, we cover it off in episode 11, and create a personal brain trust of advisors that we will go more into in the Mentors and Heroes section, but that includes Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Washington Post CEO Donald Graham, Netscape co-founder Mark Andreessen, and some others who sit on Facebook's board. He also uh, s says, I believe that over time people get remembered for what they build, and if you build something great, people don't care about what someone says about you in a movie they care about what you build and the movie <laughs> that he may might be referring to there is the social network which is a, a great film um, and tells you know some side of the story of the facebook founding um, and going more into cheryl here uh, who is a counterpart and right hand person for um, right hand person for mark throughout a lot of his career um, before she is sort of stepped away from Facebook more recently. But she says, uh, rather Mark says, I think the reason Sh Cheryl and Mark are a good fit is we spent most of our time talking about what we both care about and what motivated us. And I could see from Mark that what we really wanted to build was something that fundamentally was going to change who we are and how we interact. Cheryl says, the role I pay play is Mark focuses on building the product and I run the business functions of the company. So a unique sort of, uh, not really like co-founder sort of uh, display or uh, leadership sort of structure, um, but definitely one that mirrors that. And that's, a I think, a unique sort of structure that we should call out within Mark here because a lot of the either founders and or um, leaders that we've seen is definitely a more of a traditional hierarchical structure where they are the one at the top, the CEO who is making the decisions for the most part. There really is not a 1A and 1B um, versus what Mark and Cheryl are describing is that each of them are really responsible for key areas of the business that they have strengths in and they work closely hand in hand and had worked closely hand in hand 
to make it successful. So that definitely takes a unique uh, pairing, uh, a consumer and business split with Cheryl, as Mark describes it. And what he really admires her, about her, too, is the combination of both IQ and uh, EQ. And so uh, a few other sort of leadership qualities and things that he has quoted within the Tim Ferriss interview is he says, good leadership is getting people to where you want to go. Good cohesion amongst the team is also the priority. And he really pegs himself as a product-focused leader. And I think that would jive with episode two, Steve Jobs being kind of his, one of his advisors, mentors, uh, heroes, if you will, too. And Steve was really a product person first, too. And so th that's definitely a parallel of him being a product, maybe over uh, a person or a people person or, or that sort of thing. And so um, let's go into a little bit of, you know, with it's certainly been a financial success. Uh, certainly his leadership has evolved over time as how he's sort of foreseen within the business community, within the public as well, you know, being a social platform definitely um, is not unscathed or doesn't come under criticism at times of potentially his leadership, how he's building that product, um, you know, its involvement with things outside of just the platform itself. And so um, part of that is throughout time, they face some challenges and criticisms for sure. And some of that is in the form of privacy concerns, data scandals. So one of the more significant ones was the numerous privacy concerns. Uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal in 2018, where the personal data of millions of users was uh, in a, in, improperly harvest, harvested, raised serious really questions about their handling of a lot of the user data that they were able to collect throughout the years. Uh, regulatory issues too, so facing ongoing sort of regulatory scrutiny with antitrust concerns, misinformation, hate speech, influence on elections uh, resulted in a lot of different legal battles, fines, calls for increased regulation of their platform, addiction um, for, for teens and, and social sort of behavior there as well. Uh, failure. They've also be come across some failures in product launches throughout time too. So Facebook Home, an attempt to create a custom Android interface, failed to gain tra traction, eventually discontinued just to name one. Uh, Facebook Gifts, Facebook Deals also didn't achieve the expected success. So they've launched a few things and, and learned and uh, failed from those and uh, tried to come up with other products or focus in on maybe more of their core products as a result. Criticism of handling of misinformation and, and hate speech is certainly another. Uh, critics argue that H Facebook has not done enough to com combat the spread of false information and harmful content on its platform. Certainly, I think uh, at the origin of the social platform that he was developing, he never thought he would be sort of not in the business, but also responsible for and having to uh, hire and figure out systems in which uh, some of these things are controlled, uh, of which, you know, comes into fire uh, or in question, I guess, of certain proponents of people from a from a free speech angle, as well as, you know, should there be things that uh, police these sort of things or not. So lots of different um, strong thoughts, I would say, as far as the uh, that piece of what the platform is offering. Internal strife and employee dissatisfaction dissatisfaction a little bit too so you know there's some extreme cases of people kind of whistleblowing within the company um, companies handling of political ads uh, diversity work workplace culture so on and so forth also controversial acquisitions so uh, I think one other thing from Zuckerberg and uh, Facebook sort of Notoriety is that they, from a product standpoint, sometimes um, are, in a sense, to put it s s more simply, is that they sort of steal or, or look at other products that other companies are forming and form kind of their own version of it, possibly. So 
acquisition of Instagram, WhatsApp were successful, but they also raised concerns about Facebook's growing monopoly, social power. Um, Despite the challenges, he's achieved, obviously, remarkable success turning Facebook into one of the largest and most influential uh, companies. Uh, certainly taking some flack with the with the positioning also of Meta, uh, Facebook into Meta and the whole uh, Reality Labs spending a tremendous amount of um, capital and money into forming out uh, the sort of distributed workforce, the, the augmented and virtual reality that is becoming more and more um, of a topic within the tech world there as well and so um, definitely have faced their series of challenges ups and downs for sure as a company Um, today certainly are uh, at the have a lot of great positive momentum um, with what they have rolled out and their role within AI and being kind of in an open source modeling position for that final section here that we will cover off on will include a few of his mentors and some things and parallels to those that we've uh, mentioned a little bit of, but let's go a little bit further into that. So uh, namely, first, Steve Jobs, we covered on episode two. So Steve Jobs, biographer, Walter Isaacson says that Jobs and Zuckerberg had a lot of mutual respect for each other. He said, I once asked Jobs who he admired in the value. Marx was the first name on his lips. He felt an odd kinship to Mark, said Isaacson. Jobs admired Mark's intuitive feel for when Facebook needed to go next and his passion and willingness. Zuckerberg said that Jobs had advised him on how to create a management team at Facebook that was focused on building as high quality and good things as you are at Apple. Keeping organizational focus is one of the topics Mark also discussed with Steve Jobs, who he says was in agreement with him on it. Steve Jobs believed in the power of passion. He once said people with passion can change the world for the better. Jobs claimed that the passion he had for his work made all the difference in his life. Uh, He gave a uh, famous 2005 Stanford commencement address, which he says, If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. It also says Mark, in addition to Steve Jobs, on his weekends, he can read a renowned management expert, of which I think has been quoted here within the Mentors series of some other episodes here, but uh, Peter Drucker, as well as he asked his management idol, Don Graham, if he could shadow him. He spent hours chatting also with Jobs and Gates. Um, Sean Parker, so he was a co-founder of Napster, early advisor to Facebook, played a crucial role in the early days of the company, helped him navigate the tech industry, offering strategic advice, provided valuable insights on scaling and networking. Peter Thiel, Co-founder of PayPal, early investor in Facebook, another influential figure in his career. Teal's entrepreneurial wisdom and contrarian thinking have influenced uh, Zuck's approach to business and innovation. Reed Hoffman, uh, co-founder of LinkedIn, has also been a mentor to Mark. His expertise in building and scaling a su- successful social network has been valuable to Zuckerberg as Facebook grew. And finally, Don Graham, uh, former CEO of Washington Post, served on Facebook's board, was a mentor to Mark. Graham's experience in media and business strategy provided Zuck with valuable guidance as Facebook expanded its reach. In addition to those mentors that he worked closely with, he also did have some uh, heroes that he had quoted too. So Albert Einstein, uh, Zuck has expressed admiration for the for the legendary physicist Einstein, cited his intellectual curiosity, innovative thinking, and contributed contributions to science as inspirational. Abe Lincoln, the 16th president of the U.S., uh, is another figure whom Zuck considers a hero. Praised Lincoln's leadership during challenging times in American history, particularly his ability to unite people and his commitment to democracy gates and jobs we mentioned too so 
Um, that will really round out the mentors and heroes section. And there are a variety of sources that I looked at within this episode uh, as far as researching Mark and his leadership style. One of them is uh, Think Like Zuck, so a book that was written on kind of five main qualities of Mark Zuckerberg and his leadership style, so that was very helpful, as well as uh, Tim Ferriss, Lex Friedman interviews, as well as the Morning Brew one quoted earlier. So a variety of different uh, sources and things that helped pull this episode together. Uh, Certainly a tech giant, uh, one that has um, served as a original founder of Facebook and continues to build out his grand vision for how Facebook and Meta evolves over time. Uh, Certainly been in the uh, news and headlines recently as he's definitely been more public with his thoughts on uh, virtual reality, AI, um, doing interviews, that sort of thing. So the perception of him, I think, has changed over time as well within some people as um, he kind of comments in public, uh, thinks through some of these leadership things on his own, uh, testifies before Congress on some of these issues, really open, honest uh, at, at times with how he feels about certain things. So Zuckerberg, definitely a product-driven uh, leader and one in which he definitely has the grand vision of where these products go. Definitely a tinkerer, a hacker, if you will. He really instills that within the culture of Facebook. More recently, too, he felt the company overhired, as well as a lot of tech companies are going through this kind of change, and he's really um, got the company's sort of quote-unquote fit um, decreasing their workforce and really trying to hone in on their core products and advance those for the future. So overall, a great leader, uh, one you can choose to uh, poke sort of holes on uh, some of his past, some of the things that Facebook has gone through, but certainly uh, he has endured that time. Facebook has endured as a company, and they certainly, I think, will endure through the future. So with that, episode 29 on Mark Zuckerberg. Thanks for listening, and we will be back here with episode 30 soon. Thanks for listening.